proud supporters of Africa this week. Anjan, with us, you are number one. The resignation of Dominique Strauss-Kahn as head of the IMF has intensified a race for global finance's top job. It has gone to Europe for 65 years and the favorite is now French finance minister Christine Lagarde, but fast-growing development economies want to put their own candidate. Thomas Wheeler, former South African diplomat and foreign affairs expert at the South African Institute of International Relations. The candidacies have to be decided or submitted by the 14th of June. Now you can't change the rules of the IMF in that short space of time. So this again remains a rather long-term vision and problem that needs to be dealt with. You're talking about the reforms. Now, traditionally the IMF is run by the Europeans and the World Bank by um, the Americans and the principle is predicated on the idea of voting rights. Could you explain that to us? Yes, uh, this goes back right to uh, the foundation 1945 when the major contributors to the IMF were given votes in accordance with their with their, num their amount that they put into the pot, as it were. Right. So that means that the United States and Europe as a bloc have about 50% of the voting rights, and then other countries that have joined since have 0.5% mm -hmm. or, you know, very small amounts. Now, it, this makes it a different organization from the United Nations, for instance, where one country, one vote applies. It doesn't apply in these financial institutions. And to, to change that, you know, there may be a certain amount of uh, talk about it. Yes, it's desirable, right. but uh, national interests are at stake here, and it's going to take quite some time to move those. Well, with the changing geopolitical dynamics internationally and the rise of the emerging markets, mm. um, the, the attempt to reform the IMF has actually begun. And at mm. the last G20 summit in South Korea, some of these emerging market countries were given a larger proportion of right. their voting rights. Where does Africa fit in this continuum? Well, I'm afraid that we're still, you know, very small economies in the totality of the world, the big economies being China, India, and Brazil, and so on, uh, who are probably moving up. But it'll take some time for Africa as a whole to really get into the big league, in spite of the growth that is taking place, but it's, it, you know. Let's talk about some of the front runners, because the name that's being bandied about right now is that of the current French finance minister, Christine Lagarde. Hmm. Now, um, there are some reservations about that, but, um, you know, Chancellor Angela Merkel of uh, Germany is actually supporting this candidacy on the basis of uh, Mrs. Lagarde's management of the European Union situation post-credit crisis, of how France led the G20. It really happened under her stewardship, mm. and the fact that she's a woman. Yes. Well, this is uh, something of a, of a of movement. She would be the, if she were elected, she'd be the first woman uh, managing director of the IMF. So it's a, it's a small step. Uh, in reform. The others will have to probably take a bit longer, as I've said, simply because there are structural changes that have to take place. The Initiative for Global Development and Delberg Global Advisors recently released the Frontier 100 report on Sub-Saharan Africa's multinational corporations. As part of CNBC Africa's ongoing coverage on Africa Day, we were joined by James Mwangi, Global Managing Partner of Delberg Global Development Advisors, to give us further insights. The evidence is strong and visible that African companies are beginning to expand beyond their borders uh, into the rest of the region. Now, of course, many companies in South Africa and in North Africa had already reached that scale and, and, and yeah. expanded. What's interesting is that we're now seeing companies um, from the rest of sub-Saharan Africa really beginning to think bigger. And you see in countries like Nigeria, mm -hmm. countries like Kenya, Zimbabwe, elsewhere, yeah. uh, really thinking beyond their borders and seizing ad opportunities based on their comparative advantage. Yeah, and I mean, I can mention one from each region. You've mentioned Owando in uh, Nigeria, KCB in Kenya, Certainly. Um, Econet in Zimbabwe, MTN right here. Absolutely, um, and, and the examples are numerous. Again, you know, um, whether you're looking at the energy sector where you know, you're seeing Africa's rising demand for energy really helping companies like Oando, like yeah. Kennel Cobble, yeah. um, like, uh, uh, like Gulf Energy, among others, really grow rapidly. If you look at access to finance, you see companies like you know, um, uh, Bank, uh, United Bank of Africa and yeah. several others coming out of Nigeria, like Equity Bank, really driving innovation yes. uh, at the base of the pyramid. 
um, you're starting to see that innovation really kick in mm. across the region. So how would you describe an African multinational then? I think in our, in our thinking, we're really looking at those companies that really trace their roots to an African country, but have made significant efforts to expand into markets beyond their home base. And this is important for a number of reasons. One is, of course, growth is always good. But frankly, the skills you need to really move beyond your home market mm. are the skills that distinguish a company that's really based on a few sets of local relationships mm. and, and unique local uh, situations from a real potential champion in the future. Now, before the credit crisis, we saw these so-called African champions uh, growing at an average of 30% uh, per annum and really outpacing their counterparts in the developed markets. How do they fare today, especially when you compare them to S&P 500 companies? Um, I think you see them continuing to outperform uh, on almost any measure. Uh, and that's not surprising because at the end of the day, somewhat surprisingly, Africa as a whole has weathered the crisis, the economic crisis, better than other regions. Uh, and you see this reflected in the way that the companies have grown. You also see the fact that there's a whole very latent and untapped market that they're going into. So regardless of which strategy they're pursuing, mm -hmm. they're finding a lot of open running room um, to expand and grow and sustain those growth rates right. that, uh, that are really in excess of 30%. The International Monetary Fund this month warned that Swaziland faces a severe financial crisis caused by loss in earnings from Swaziland's main source of revenue, a customs union with neighboring countries. The fund also warned on governments overspending, especially on salaries. Governments' move to slash salaries of civil servants has sparked a backlash with street protests last month, violently dispersed by the police. There are teacher protests for June 1st. Melissa Ajunan, country risk analyst at Rand Merchant Bank. Economic indicators that have come out um, in, in the past few weeks all point towards that sort of trend. Um, you're looking at uh, foreign reserves only being able to cover about 2.6 months of imports. Mm -hmm. um, the overall budget deficit for fiscal year March 2011 was about 14.5%. And your current account is forecast at about 18.5% of GDP last yeah. year. So all of those don't board well for the country. Okay, what's being proposed as a way to get out of the mess? We talk about austerity measures. The government must now slash salaries for a very bloated civil service. Oh, well, currently the government is in a six-month staff-monitored program with the IMF, and hopefully if all goes according to plan, that should pave the way for some sort of formal arrangement between Swaziland and the IMF. And as well, if, if Swaziland actually gets the letter of comfort from the IMF, it should open up the door for the country to receive funding from other multilateral organizations such as the World Bank and the African Development Bank as well. What's the appetite? to provide loans for a small country like Swaziland. And I'm talking about the fact that their reserve position is significantly compromised and there's just a sense that the economy is not productive enough to generate income for them to pay back some of these loans. I think the risk appetite isn't very good for Swaziland at this point. Um, as I said uh, earlier, the, the IMF, um, a, lot of, a lot is riding on that. Uh, if they get that letter of comfort, if they successfully go through their staff monitored program, that would open up the door for them mm. and improve risk appetite for the country. It's also been suggested that a bailout plan devised by the regional community, SADC, could be on the cards, but that South Africa should be prepared to, you know, loosen up the purse strings a little bit. Um, I think a bailout obviously cannot be ruled out at this stage. Uh, I think the trend for Swaziland has been negative for so long. Um, yes, it could come from South Africa. Um, who would actually facilitate the entire program, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but yes, um, I think it would bode well for um, regional stability if um, somebody's there to help the country out. Individual East African countries would probably be better placed to mitigate bad news and to capitalize on the good by acting together. This is the general sentiment at the third annual conference on Treasury, Risk and Cash Management that was held in Nairobi. From Nairobi on the effort to overcome economic challenges and embrace opportunities in East Africa is Peter Green, Director of Transaction.com at Eurofinance. The conference we've got about 215 delegates uh, two-thirds or three-quarters of which are from corporate treasurers 
and a quarter of which are banks. So the objective is to get the industry, corporate treasury industry, and the providers of services to discuss the hot topics, um, see what the, uh, the current issues are out there, and, and as you said in the introduction, to really look at a, from a regional perspective, how the region fits in with uh, what's happening globally. Uh, we run similar conferences uh, in all regions of the world, and it's interesting to compare some of the uh, contrasting views that come out across the, the regions. What are key issues to emerge from the sector of Treasury cash and trade management? The, the core topics um, don't change. The Treasury's interest is in uh, liquidity, financial risk management, funding. Uh, but the, the priorities of that have definitely changed over the last few years with the banking crisis, with the uh, contagion to the real economy. Um, but one of the interesting things that's come out of this conference is there is much more of a, a regional focus. Uh, we ask globally what current issues are, what the, uh, the challenge is, and, and top of the list globally is the global economy. And I think that illustrates the... Uh, the challenge that the US has that from a, a Europe perspective, uh, their view is very much the state of the economy. That hardly registered on the list of priorities here in, uh, in Nairobi. Um, top of the list was FX. Next was um, the uh, volatility um, of, uh, around commodities, the oil price. Um, so the things that are concerning the rest of the world uh, the counterparty risk, uh, the, the banking stability weren't the same sort of things that come out here. Uh, political was also high on the agenda, which I think probably reflects the elections coming up next year in, in Kenya, that those yeah. are seen as a potential concern. Nigeria's president, good luck Jonathan, will be inaugurated as president on Sunday the 29th of May. Bamidele Aturu, general counsel of Bamidele Aturu and Co, joined us from Lagos to tell us more. It's fair to say that Nigerians are not um, quite excited because um, you know the president has been re-elected as it were and so it's not as if you are having a change of button from one <laughs> president to another uh, but generally you can also say that a large segment of Nigerians are also happy in some sense that although the election was greeted with some violence that uh, it will appear that right. uh, we are over that now. So uh, people are also hoping that what happened on October 1st when uh, we were doing the 50th uh, anniversary of our independence uh, will not take place again. You right. know, some people bombed the uh, yeah. venue of the celebration. So mm -hmm. people are also hoping that the security people are on top of the situation. Yeah. All right, now this afternoon, uh, Mr. Jonathan had the last session with the Federal Executive Council, but he didn't dissolve it. What does that mean? Well, for people who are quite familiar with the political system in Nigeria, uh, that clearly is a reflection of the fact that um, the president has to consult with members of the ruling political party, People's Democratic Party, PDP. Um, what is happening now is that all the 36 states branches of the party have submitted list of prospective ministers. And it will take some time for the president to sift through, to sift through this um, uh, list and in any event uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, the, there have been crises in many of the branches of the parties in the, in the states. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them are having conflicting names, multiple lists, so that is creating some crisis for the president mm -hmm. and he's not able at this moment I want to believe to categorically say that um, he's taking this person and not this person as minister. Mm -hmm. So he will need time so that he doesn't create some vacuum. Uh, I believe that that is why the president refused to dissolve the cabinet. 